Hello Year 12, I hope you are still well um, and staying safe. I hope that last week's lesson was really helpful and um, having uh, the lesson recorded hopefully made you feel as though you weren't missing out on anything. So what I'm going to do today, I'm going to dive into the second uh, poem that's in the Poem of the Decades anthology. Um, I will go through them in the order that they are in the actual book. Don't worry if you haven't got the book yet though, as I said last week, just make some notes on some lined paper and then as soon as you uh, are able to get the book, just transfer your notes into the book. So before we go ahead and analyse the poem uh, stanza by stanza, as I did last week, uh, what I'd like you to do is have a little go at this starting activity, as we would if we were in lessons. Uh, you've got some concepts there, some terms that I'd like you to have a go at defining. Some of them are going to be ones that you already know and that we've gone over, so it's just refreshing your memory. And then uh, there are two on there that you may not um, know yet, so we'll go over those and I'll explain them. So don't worry, just either leave those to last or you can uh, leave a little gap and go back to them. So if you want to hit pause and write those down. Okay, hopefully you did hit pause. Now, defining these terms... Binary, we've looked at the idea of binaries before. Um, lots of things in literature come as binaries. Um, it's this idea of relating to or having two parts. Uh, when we looked at streetcar, for example, we looked at the idea of archetypes um, and the roles that, that certain characters um, fall into. And this idea then as well of being masculine and feminine, that, that would be a um, perfect example of a binary then in literature. So uh, the idea of having or relating to two parts, in that case, with gender. Uh, zoomorphic, that might be a word that you've not come across before. So if something is zoomorphic, it is having or representing animal forms or gods of an animal form. So it's giving characteristics of an animal to a certain object. Anthropomorphism is the opposite of that. So it's giving a human characteristics of a god or an animal, or of an object, sort of the opposite of personification as well. Um, so you've got zoomorphic and anthropomorphic, which are obviously two new terms. Okay, so we'll have a little look at how, how they're used in this poem. Oxymoron, we've had a little look at what an oxymoron is before, so two contradicting words that are used next to one another. So for example, bittersweet, deafening silence. Symbolism, again, we've looked at that at GCSE, so um, the idea of using an object, a figure, an event, situation or other idea in a written work to represent something else. And it's usually something that's happening at the time that the author's writing about um, whatever it is they're writing. Anaphora is a word or a phrase that is repeated at the beginning of multiple sentences throughout a piece of writing. We did actually see that in the poem that we looked at last time. Uh, there was a stanza there, and actually I'll point it out to you now. Um, so, uh, this bit here. So we've got the opening um, of the stanza of each line um, is the same phrase. So it's the idea of anam anaphora. So what we'll do, we will um, dive now into analysing the poem. I'll go through it and I'll break it up stanza by stanza and we'll see where some of these um, terms then are used. We can use them when we're discussing this poem. Okay, so this week the poem that we're going to have a little look at is Chainsaw vs. the Pampas Grass. Now this is a longer poem than the one we looked at last week um, and I know at the moment my visualiser is covering the poem on the PowerPoint but what I will do is split that up into two uh, slides in a moment and we'll go through it. So I will read through it first of all. I've got some questions then that I would like you to have a little think of so that you've got your own critical perspective on the poem before I then um, give you some suggestions about my thoughts on this um, and some of the sort of research that I've done on this poem. So uh, before we begin, I'll just point out what we mean by pampas grass. You've probably seen uh, this plant uh, before, but it's that plant there with the sort of long stems and the, the feathers on the top, which is what sort of it's described as in this poem. So we'll have a little read through it, and as I said, I'll give you some questions then once I've read through it so that you can get your first initial ideas down. So, chainsaw versus the pampas grass. It seemed an unlikely match. All winter unplugged, grinding its teeth in a plastic sleeve, the chainsaw swung nose down from a hook in the dark room under the hatch in the floor. When offered the can, it knocked back a quarter pint of engine oil, and juices ran from its joints and threads, oozed across the guide bar and the maker's mark name, into the dry links. 
from the summer house, still holding one last gulf of last year's heat behind its double doors, and hung with a weightless wreckage of wasps and flies, moth-balled in sp spider's wool. From there I trailed the day-glow orange power line, the length of the lawn and the garden path, fed it out like powder from a keg, then walked back to the socket and flicked the switch, then walked again and coupled the saw to the flex, clipped them together, then dropped the safety catch and gunned the trigger. No gearing up or getting to, s to speed, just an instant rage. The rush of metal lashing out at air connected to the mains, the chainsaw with its perfect disregard, its mood to tangle with cloth or jewellery or hair, the chainsaw with its bloody desire, its sweet tooth for the flesh of the face and the bones underneath, its grand plan to kick back against nail or not and rear up into the brain. I let it flare, lifted it into the sun and felt the hundred beats per second drumming in its heart and felt the drive wheel gargle in its throat. The pampas grass with its ludicrous feathers and plumes, the pampas grass taking the warmth and light from cuttings and bulbs, sunning itself, stealing the show with its footstools, cushions and tufts, and its twelve-foot spears. This was the sledgehammer taken to crack the nut. Probably all that was needed here was a good pull or shove or a pitchfork to lever it out at its base. Overkill. I touched the blur of the blade against the nearmost tip of a reed. It didn't exist. I dabbed at a stalk that swooned, docked a couple of heads, dismissed the top third of its can canes with a sideward sweep at shoulder height. This was a game. I lifted the fringe of undergrowth, carved at the trunk. Plant juice spat from the pipes and tubes. The dust flew out as I ripped into pockets of dark, secret warmth. To clear a space to work, I raked whatever was severed or felled or torn towards the dead zone under the outhouse wall, to be fired, then cut and raked, cut and raked, till what was left was a flat stump the size of a barrel lid, that wouldn't be dug with a spade or prized from the earth. Wanting to finish things off, I took up the saw, and drove it vertically downwards into the upped roots, but the blade became choked with soil or fouled with weeds, or what was sliced or split somehow closed and mended behind, like cutting at water or air with a knife. I poured barbecue fluid into the patch and threw in a match. It flamed for a minute, smoked for a minute more, and went out. I left it at that. In the weeks that came, new shoots like asparagus tips sprung up from its nest, and by June it was riding high in its saddle, wearing a new crown. Corn in Egypt. I looked on from the upstairs window, like the midday moon. Back below stairs on its hook, the chainsaw seethed. I left it a year to work back through its man-made dreams, to try to forget the seamless urge to persist was as far as it got. Okay, so we, as we've read through it, I hope that um, some of the imagery has been really obvious and hopefully you've been able to pick out some um, key ideas from the reading of that. Uh, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to put those questions up for you and I'd like you to have a little go at answering those uh, before we sort of dive into the um, stanza by stanza analysis. So number one, what can you infer from the title? So chainsaw versus pampas grass. And what do you think the chainsaw and the pampas grass represent? Uh, select then at least two lexical sets and make some notes on the imagery or message that they present to you. Okay, so it's all about developing your critical opinion um, so just make sure that you do that first, okay? So hit pause and have a little go at answering those. All right, so let's go through it um, stanza by stanza and analyze and break down some of the meanings then and some of the ideas that are presented in uh, this poem. So let's start with the um, title and I've got my, my own notes here for you as well. Um, so I've tried to zoom in a little bit more this week um, and hopefully you can see my notes nice and clearly then. Um, sorry, they are a little bit all over the place, but this is this is exactly what I do with my copy um, And obviously when you get your copy, you're going to want to make similar notes as well so um, As I said last week don't neglect the title 
um, it establishes for us some ideas before we've even started to look through the poem. Now, throughout the poem, there is a sense of conflict. It's one of the main themes in this poem, and it's established right from the beginning, because we've got um, the title uh, giving us that idea of this struggle of power and conflict. The theme is confirmed even in this title, this opening, Chainsaw versus the Pampas Grass, suggesting that there is going to be this conflict between the two, that they're pitted against one another. So let's have a look then at that first stanza. Now, again, in that first opening line, um, the first sentence of that stanza, um, it seems an unlikely match. We've got this declarative sentence type, uh, type that statement, um, it's very sim again, simple sentence. It's uh, very straightforward in establishing the idea of conflict. It seems an unlikely match. And the adjective there, unlikely match. It's almost setting it up as though it is a sporting event, like a boxing match. It's, it seems already that we have that idea that there's going to be violence, that there's going to be a clash. So established straight from the, the beginning there. All winter unplugged, grinding its teeth in that plastic sleeve. So all winter we've got almost um, the idea of establishing a timeline again, as we did in the uh, previous poem. So all of the winter unplugged, grinding its teeth. So the use of the, the um, adjective unplugged there suggests straight away that it's going to be an inanimate object. But then this idea of grinding its teeth establishes the idea of animalistic and um, when we were having a little look at the techniques we can look at um, the idea of zoomorphism here. So we've got an item, an object that's been sitting all winter unplugged grinding its teeth in a plastic sleeve. The chainsaw swung nose down from a hook in the dark room so we know now it is a chainsaw. So immediately already we're thinking about something that can be quite destructive, um, something that can be quite dangerous. And the way it's described there in dark room. So that's a really interesting description of it. There's almost a gothic element to it. And you could even suggest there that there is a link to the chainsaw being the repressed feelings or desires of the writer, because it's something that's hidden away exists in this dark room hidden away under the hatch in the floor so again you know that preposition under the floor in the floor sorry and the idea of it being under the hatch it, it's again the idea of burying something so hiding something keeping something uh, pushed down so repressing something when offered the can it knocked back a quarter pint of engine oil so that is quite colloquial. We looked at colloquial language last week and that idea of it being quite casual language, but it's quite reminiscent, makes you think of knocking back um, a pint of, of beer. And that is quite a stereotypically masculine um, image being created there of drinking a pint. So you've got this idea of aggression then and something that's quite dangerous, something that's quite repressed, um, being associated with the idea of masculinity. Um, went off it knocked about a quarter pound of engine oil and juices ran from its joints and threads oozed across the guide bar and the, make, uh, the maker's name. So these um, these verbs, the oozed and the ran, and describing the juices then of, of the oil. Again, reinforcing the zoomorphic um, qualities of the chainsaw. So, um, and again, sort of linked to aggression. The idea that it's sort of um, uncontrolled um, at this point, and gulping down this, this oil and into the links. So quite powerful um, masculine depiction there. Um, I just want to double check I'm not missing any of my notes. No, great. So let's move on to the next one, next stanza. So five summers. Uh, from sorry, from the summer house, um, still holding one last gulp of last year's heat behind its double doors. So quite vivid imagery here. We've got this idea of the summer house, like a shed, um, where this the chainsaw is kept, and um, still holding on to last year's heat. 
um, behind the double doors. So again, establishing that timeline of how long um, it's been there, that it's been waiting impatiently, grinding its teeth. Still holding one last gulp of last uh, year's heat behind its double doors and hung with the weightless wreckage of wasps and flies, mothballed in spider's wool. So again, linking to that idea of it being quite vivid imagery, we've got the um, alliteration there, the weightless wreckage of wasps and flies and it, again it's that idea of um, uh, death and um, destruction um, and again the timeline of how long it's been there that there's all this sort of um, carnage then of um, insects that have died throughout the, the winter. From there I trailed the day glow orange power line, the length of the lawn and the garden path. So first of all, we've got that very vivid imagery, quite strong imagery, a very bright, powerful colour there, and it's clashing against the idea of the lawn and the garden path, so those natural images there um, of nature. And you could suggest, it could suggest this use of the alliteration, the length of the lawn, there's a quite um, elongated letters uh, to speak, so there's almost an anticipation here of um, the build-up of actually plugging in and getting ready to use this chainsaw. So there's an anticipation growing and building with the use of some of this alliteration in this stanza. Um, the length of the lawn fed it out like powder from a keg. So quite a detailed description of what's going on here and that simile, like powder from a keg. Now what that means, a keg is like a barrel basically of um, gunpowder and it's a suggestion of um, almost creating a line of gunpowder as he's going out so again linking with the idea of destruction um, and that foreshadowing of the, the um, destruction, the havoc that this chainsaw is going to inflict. Um, back to the socket and flicked the switch, then walked again and coupled the sword to the flex. So again, really detailed, um, really drawing out the description of getting the chainsaw ready, of preparing it, of prepping it, of, you know, um, going in, plugging it in, um, bringing it out, then going back, switching it on. So it's, it's building that anticipation. Um, Comes it, clip them together, then drop the safety catch and gun the trigger. Now, uh, we talked, I did mention this last uh, week about the idea of um, lines being end stopped. So we've got that full stop at the end of this line in the poem, really sort of building that suspense because now it's almost with that imagery of gun the trigger, very aggressive, like a gun. Um, again, something that's linked to death, destruction. So it's that pause, that anticipation, almost like a cliffhanger there in that in that stanza before then going on to what the um, chainsaw is actually going to do. So if we have a little look and dive straight into the next stanza. No gearing up or getting to speed, just an instant rage. So there's that emph emphasis on how quickly um, that, that rage has been started, that adjective instant rage. Uh, the idea of strength then and violence coming into that, the idea of rage, very strong uh, description, very uh, strong emotion there, so emotive language, very powerful. The rush of metal lashing out at air, so again that verb lashing, very powerful. We've got this um, personification of the um, chainsaw this time. We could say it's slightly um, zoomorphic as well, the idea of it being almost, almost animalistic, the idea of it lashing out like a wild animal. Connected to the mane, but this is still anchored, it's still tied to something. Now I've made a suggestion there, could it be um, tied to him and his emotion and that idea of even when we get angry, um, we know not to take things too far. Um, you know, when we're angry with someone, uh, we know that we shouldn't be hitting them, for example. You know, we, we still remain um, calm and connected to logic. 
So the suggestion there connected to the main, if we are saying that the um, chainsaw is maybe a representation or symbolism of um, masculinity and of aggression, the fact that it is connected to a main, it's still connected to him. He still has influence and power over it. So it's still within his um, within his power to, to take control of it and um, to use that aggression in the way that he chooses. Um, so it then goes on to sort of quite quite graphic imagery and it's almost um, the idea of, of something that's so destructive being quite alluring um, and you know I, I suppose when we indulge in those ideas of what if um, and it's quite sickening descriptions in some some parts of this so let's have a little look at it now um, the chainsaw with its perfect disregard so almost as though it's it's personified again it's 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 made human it has a disregard for things it ha it's unfeeling um just as i suppose when when we become angry we can say things that can be very hurtful and we've got that disregard then for how that makes the other person feel but it talks about the mood again personifying the, the chainsaw to tangle with cloth or jewelry or hair so that as I said just now, is is quite a sort of um, a what if? What if, what if it did, you know, catch in his clothing? What if it did catch in in a necklace or in into a bit of hair? Is the nature of how dis of how violent and destructive that could be? The chainsaw with its bloody desire again personification. We could say as well, um, zoomorphic there, almost like a wild animal um, trying to hunt down prey. And having that sort of um, bloody desire, the sweet tooth, to sort of bite into something for the flesh of the face. And that sort of alliteration making it almost even more graphic and um, like repulsive to think of. The idea of um, the chainsaw kicking back and ending up in, um, embedding in somebody's face. And it's sweet tooth uh, for the flesh of the face and the bones underneath. So, so really um, powerful imagery there. You know, almost quite gruesome. It's grand plan, so almost insidious. That idea of it being um, something that can think, that can plot, that can plan to do these things. To kick back against the nail or not, and rear up. So again, quite zoomorphic there. Think about um, you know, like horses rearing up, rear up into the brain so again quite gruesome quite um quite horrific um if, if that was to happen but rather than be repulsed by that our reader um our person um our narrator in this sort of narrative of this poem is almost quite is glorifying it i let it flare lifted it into the sun it almost glorifies that idea of it being a weapon of destruction um glorifying it i let it flare lifted it into the sun so that um the imagery of that and the use of that verb lifted it into the sun again glorifying it idolizing it lifting it up putting it higher than himself um so you know he's he's almost quite um enamored with this idea of it being so destructive um that it could it could uh, create such wreckage and felt the hundred beats per second drumming in its heart and felt the drive wheel gargle in its throat. Now, the drumming in its heart, the gargle in its throat, again, quite zoomorphic there, um, quite animalistic. So um, you've also got this um, anaphora, that uh, repetition of it and felt and felt. So it's, it's quite... Um, it's quite an experience for him. He's feeling this, felt the hundred um, beats, uh, felt the drive wheel. I think the, the word I'm thinking of is visceral, like quite quite a sort of vivid uh, feeling for him, quite clear. That aggression, and you know, I've made a little note there. The idea of aggression, and you know, not to say it's right at all. Stereotypically, aggression is seen as a very male trait, um, and it's something that's being glorified here. T seen as a typically masculine stereotype, eager to fight, particularly if you link it back to the idea of it knocking back that pint earlier. You know, you think about it again, stereotypically, it's not to say all men, but that idea that, you know, stereotypically, 
men, you know, they get drunk, they're drinking, and then that, that eagerness to fight, that aggression comes out. So it's, it's quite a stereotypically masculine portrayal there of, of the um, chainsaw. And here as well, when um, it talks about the uh, gargle in the throat, and when he's talking about the drumming in its heart, it's almost like there's an eagerness in the chainsaw to, uh, to destroy things. And again, is this a projected feeling then of the writer, of the poet, of maybe the narrator? So that projection of feelings, is it excitement that's being projected and felt there? The idea of racing heart, a gargle in the throat, almost like a growl, um, that wild primitive idea, is it anger? So, you know, again, you can offer both of those in the exam when you're sort of speculating about what could be implied by that. Okay, we'll go on to the next section, um, and it's quite a contrast here. So it's interesting as well that we've had these um, three stanzas that have built up to the description of the um, chainsaw and really emphasised the chainsaw. There's been that very much um, um, a build-up, that anticipation, slow build-up with the chainsaw. But here, now, we're switching the focus to the pampas grass. And um, you can see I've colour coded the difference here when it's talking about these sort of softer qualities when we come to the um, pampas grass with some of the um, sort of more aggressive language, which I've done in, in green um, and more vivid um, images in green. So uh, the pampas grass with its ludicrous feathers. So again, think about the adjective there that's being used to describe uh, these plumes. At the, at the top of the the, uh, the grass. Ludicrous feathers. It's seen as something that's um, ridiculous. There's a mocking tone to it. Maybe with the ideas of feathers, could it be something that symbolises something softer and therefore stereotypically, again I'm not talking about all women here, but that idea of um, femininity and being female is something quite, quite soft and nurturing. Something that then for the um, narrator of the poem is seen as something quite um, ridiculous and unnecessary. The pampas grass with its ludicrous feathers and plumes. The pampas grass taking the warmth and light. So we've again got some anaphora here because both lines start with the pampas grass. Um, and again, it's sort of maybe showing that divide between um, the chainsaw that was um, so focused on at the beginning of this poem and then cutting to this. It's interesting that this is a very much smaller stanza here when describing the pampas grass. This is all it gets in terms of description. Um, the pampas grass taking the warmth and light. So that verb as well, taking the warmth and light, it almost suggests an air of selfishness to the pampas grass. Um, it's taking something for itself um, and not giving or providing anything um, and just, it, you know, all of its um, showiness is quite ludicrous, this idea of it being um, full of feathers and plumes like a bird, um, it, it's, it's ridiculous. Uh, taking the warmth and light, very much juxtaposed as well in terms of the nature of this. Taking the warmth and light almost gives us this idea of it um, sunbathing, relaxing, um, being, you know, in no way aggressive, whereas if you look at comparing that and juxtaposing that with um, the chainsaw, it was sat seething, grinding its teeth, waiting all winter, whereas here the pampas grass is warming and sunning, sunning itself, far more relaxed. From cuttings and bulbs, sunning itself, so that again, as I said, the antithesis there of the description of the chainsaw, stealing the show. Now, again, those sort of verbs, um, taking, stealing, maybe there's an air of envy to, um, to, uh, towards the pampas grass that is either felt by the uh, narrator of this narrative in the poem or um, in terms of then the chainsaw, does the chainsaw envy um, the pampas grass? Stealing the show with its footstools, cushions and tufts, with its 12 foot spears. Now, interesting description, you know, footstools, cushion, tufts, it almost uh, suggests something about the home here. And again, very stereotypical, 
but you know you think of the home stereotypically as being um, the, the domain of the woman of femininity of something feminine and the idea that women then are the ones that sort of fill the homes with these silly little adornments like footstools and cushions that are um, not necessarily needed or required um, so you've got um, again that idea of femininity but it's contrasted here with the idea of a 12 foot spear so the spears now that can be interpreted in different ways now um, someone suggested that idea of it being quite a phallic symbol we have looked at that phallic symbol is um, something that is reminiscent of um, an erection of the penis so um, you've got a link there to masculinity as well um, but the masculine element of the pampas grass is the defensive part of it the spear so um, you've got there defends itself and this is almost sh foreshadowing the fact that um, despite everything that the um, chainsaw does to the pampas grass it doesn't actually um, uh, achieve its aim of destroying it so actually the pampas grass is the winner it's the one that ends up um, uh, victorious in, in this this fight between the two um, and you know you can link that then to that opening line of it seems an unlikely match so yeah on the surface it does seem unlikely as a, a chainsaw going up against um, a weed essentially um, but yet the pampas grass is the one that ends up victorious because it comes back um, so it's that um, juxtaposition realizes the absurdity of um, of the the pampas grass uh, and how, how sort of showy it is okay on to the next stanza then so this was the sledgehammer ready to crack the nut so you've got here um, quite a um, hyperbolic statement the idea of the sledgehammer then the um, chainsaw again being represented actually by something that's man-made so you've got the man-made sledgehammer or chainsaw then being pitted against the nut or the pampas grass which again is a symbol of nature so um, it's interesting that even within this metaphor um, it sort of links to the wider metaphor throughout the whole um, extended metaphor really throughout the whole of the poem um, that it's something man-made pitted against something in nature this was a sledgehammer taken to crack the nut so it's the absurdity of it as well the, the sort of ridiculousness of this statement of how um, there's an overreaction um, and again you could talk about then that linking to aggression and the idea of being overly aggressive over something that is so um, trivial probably all that was needed was a good pull or shove or a pitchfork to lever it out of its base now um, I have read as well some interpretations of this and the idea of someone being an inexperienced gardener and that's partly why they um, choose to do this in such a sort of over-the-top way um, so that is one interpretation that you can certainly include in your responses for the exam on this um, and that there is that sort of idea of it being over the top and maybe it is because it is somebody um, that is inexperienced that's, that's doing this um, but it is very um, hyperbolic um, overkill summed up in that simple sentence there reinforcing that sort of ridiculousness of it and, and how um, absurd it is to behave in such a over-the-top manner I touched the blur of the blade now this description here and you can see some of the um, key uh, verbs that I've um, highlighted because you can see a clear difference in the um, softness of the approach here I touched I dabbed I dismissed sweep lifted um, carved far more gentle in the description here but although that seems calmer and to kind of tone down the aggression actually what it's doing is reinforcing how delicate and vulnerable the pampas grass was that there wasn't much energy or effort that was actually required to get rid of it I touched the blur of the blade and you've got there the sort of um, the alliteration blur of the, of the blade that um, plosive sound is very soft and actually um, reinforces the ease with which um, he's able to, to cut the top of that um, the, the pampas grass um, away um, it's that unnecessary aggression 
so um, that the pampas grass as well it's it's how it um, stands no chance and it highlights the inequality between the um, pampas grass being so vulnerable and so easily destroyed compared with the chainsaw which was so aggressive grinding its teeth at the start um, touch the blur of the blade against the near most tip of a reed it didn't exist again just kind of reinforcing that sort of declarative um, tone in that that um, uh, clause showing how easily then it, it just it disintegrates it no longer it's no longer there it doesn't exist anymore um, because of the aggression of the, the chainsaw I dabbed at the stalk that swooned docked a couple of heads so I haven't highlighted the um, verb swooned there but you could talk about that verb it's very stereotypically female in terms of the reaction that idea of fainting of swooning um, but it's almost as though, again, the narrator of this poem is trying to kind of emphasise the the um, absurdity of the pampas grass, how ridiculous it is. Um, it links into that verb at the beginning of um, the last stanza that talks about it being ludicrous. Uh, dismiss the top third of its canes with a swide, sideways sweep. So all of this description just emphasising just how um, easy... Uh, the pampas grass is destroyed, just sweeping along and it's barely taking any effort. Um, it's, uh, and I've made a note there, it's effortless. It's something that requires just so little energy. It's almost gentle in the way that it's being described, um, this destruction. Dismiss the top third of the canes with a sideward sweep at shoulder height. This was a game, so it's something that you could say. I mean, that description there, it, um, this was a game. Um, it's almost something that he's enjoying. Um, it's something that um, they take pleasure in. Um, it's something that's easy, that they're enjoying their participation in this destruction. I lifted the fringe of the undergrowth. Now, again, a fringe, you could say, um, stereotypically being seen as a a traditionally female thing to have um, women grow fringes I lifted the fringe of the undergrowth but in the same way um, it's that idea maybe of lifting like a skirt a fringe of something the end the underneath of something lifting the fringe of undergrowth carved at the trunk so the trunk here it's um, slightly um, juxtaposed because the idea of a trunk you see you um, tend to um, imagine a trunk as something a little bit thicker and tougher um, to cut through. So maybe this could be the foreshadowing then where there is um, some difficulty involved with cutting down the rest of it. In the next line though you've got uh, plant juice spat from the pipes and tubes. So whereas the chainsaw is being uh, personified the pampas grass is very much um, objectified. It's 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 seen as an object and it's described with its pipes and its tubes and um, the plant juice spat so the description here becomes quite um, almost graphic as though as though it's like blood that idea of killing it um, that it's spitting out plant juice like blood and dust flew as I ripped into pockets of dark secret warmth so ripping out again sort of emphasizing the aggression i know i keep coming back to that um the idea of a, of dark secret warmth now um what someone did write i can't remember who this was but someone had written about the idea of it being something quite erotic um and the idea of it being then linked to um the pampas grass if we're seeing it as something feminine um it being linked then to femininity but um, I also read that it, you could actually attribute this to the idea of um, secret reserves of strength. Um, that there is a sort of um, reluctance to the grass to give up and um, cutting in then to something that he actually can't reach. And you can see in my note there this idea of it foreshadowing that there's more to the plant than it seems. So all these ludicrous feathers at the top, um, yes, okay, they were easy to cut through um, and it was easy enough to cut through the grass of it. But actually now, coming to the roots, there's something deeper there. There's something that is resistant to the idea of being cut up and um, torn away. Let's go on to the next answer then. 
so oh I'm sorry I haven't moved that I'm sorry about that there we go I'll leave that up there for a little while for you as well okay so um to clear a space to work so realizing now how much um, destruction um he's created he's sort of taking a moment to um sort of regroup and uh, clear the area before moving on but the way he describes this is almost like a war zone to clear a space to work i raked whatever was severed fouled or torn and quite sort of violent description there that idea of as well the repetition of cutting and and dis um disregarding it um is the aftermath of this violence and um, the sort of fallout of what's happened towards the dead zone so again like i said almost like a war zone there um under the outhouse wall so again you can maybe with this preposition interpret it as being something that is um not necessary and an outhouse is a toilet an outside toilet so again that preposition placing it near something that is um that's a toilet something to do with waste um the idea of, of throwing it away um well to be fired so almost burning the dead there that idea of, of um getting rid of it through burning it burning dead um as we do with with bodies um then cut and raked cut and raked so again we've got that repetition and we've got again that idea of with um the verb cut um the idea of, of violence so what was left was a flat stump the size of a manhole cover or barrel lid that wouldn't be dug so powerful the idea of it being rooted in nature then something that's not going to be easily shifted despite the fact that all of the as i said earlier that the um the shoots of the the, the plant uh, were easy to cut away this is not going to move easily the roots are there and they are stuck in the ground they're, they're going to be very hard to get rid of wanting to finish things off so you've got this urge this this insistence of um following through with what he's planned to do and um, that desire to um, carry out his will I took up the saw and drove it vertically downwards it's almost like there's desperation here um, so and you can see my note there trying to dig down to the roots so he's trying to use this very aggressive um, description with the, the chainsaw very aggressive chainsaw to, to dig down into the upped roots and this is where we have um, this uh, connective sort of shows that it's not going to budge but the blade became choked and again it's sort of slowing down the pace here but the blade became choked so you've got that alliteration slowing down um, almost like the movement of what's happening with the chains or it's slowing down the progress of him cutting down the weeds but the blade became choked with soil or fouled with weeds so there's a corruption there the violent chainsaw then um, is rendered useless by nature so it's being choked up with the soil and with, with the weeds and what's happening with the pampas grass what was sliced or split somehow closed and mended behind so it's almost uh, like the idea of nature then um, unwilling to die that it it regenerates itself and it's that foreshadowing of what's going to come at the end uh, where it does actually regenerate and it blooms again it it grows again but the um, narrator of this um, of the narrative in this poem is unwilling to give up so easily I poured barbecue fluid into the patch and again you could talk about this idea the use of the barbecue fluid quite a stereotypically male thing uh, when we think about barbecues it's usually the male that's in charge of the barbecue um so using again something that's quite stereotypically um a male um object something that's used by males into the patch and threw in a match it flamed for a minute smoked for a minute more and went out so quite sort of um quick succession there and again we've got this kind of repetitive feel to it um flame for a minute smoked for a minute more and again establishing time here it only takes a minute um but there's almost a sense of defeat there now that last uh, simple sentence i left it at that can be interpreted in a couple of different ways it's certainly an anticlimax considering the effort and energy that the chainsaw um has given at the start of the poem 
the fact that he's tried to dig downwards into the roots um it's it's an anticlimax you know there's they've sort of met a dead end um but is the feeling here one of being dejected of um feeling that they have been that they know that they're not gonna gonna get this done or is there a feeling of confidence that they've succeeded so they throw in the match okay i've, le I've left it at that because that, that's bound to have killed it but again it's subjective it would be interesting to see what you think of that um but as i said that that's um two alternative ideas for you there okay in the final stanza then in the weeks that came new shoots like asparagus tips sprung up from its nest so again interesting we've got that time um established again so in the weeks that came new shoots so you've got as well the adjective new that suggestion of rebirth something that's um, as well growing with shoots and the simile there like asparagus tips so spear shaped again is it maybe that indication that the war between them is going to continue between the chainsaw and the pampas grass and if we think about it more in terms of themes is it going to be um between and i'll talk about this in a bit more depth in a moment um is it going to be a war between nature and man is it a war between masculinity and femininity again it's up to interpretation like asparagus tips sprung up from its nest now again interesting use there of um the word nest the noun nest you could then talk about the idea of growth if you think about birds with nests the idea they build nests is for their young to nurture them so that they can grow um and again you could talk about it being um stereotypically the idea of um children flying the nest it's usually seen as um home and typically attribute um attributed to women so again that theme of, of femininity and by june it was riding high in its saddle there's almost a feel here of like a western um and there are some themes there throughout the poem that could link to the idea of a western when it described um towards the beginning the idea of um the uh, trigger of the um the chainsaw so you, almost like a gunfight um and then coming here to this idea of it riding high in its saddle so riding like it's on a horse so it's winning that battle and rising from um that conflict um wearing a new crown so that idea of it being the victor being crowned um and winning um corn in egypt is a biblical reference so um it can um suggest lots of something uh, based on that biblical reference and um, so not only has it succeeded but it's thrived there's lots of it sprung back up again i looked on from the upstairs window now interesting kind of dynamic that's being shown here because they are looking on from a position that is above the grass the pampas grass um, and yet they haven't got the power to kill it and they haven't they've failed in that attempt yet it's looking down onto the pampas grass so it's in a position above the pampas grass um but actually the authority um there's a lack of authority there in that positioning because it hasn't succeeded in killing the pampas grass so the, the preposition from the upstairs window there is, is interesting. Like the midday moon. And again, very interesting here. You've got this oxymoron midday moon because, you know, you're not meant to see the moon during midday. But you have also as well got the idea of midday uh, links back to the idea of a western. And the idea of a shootout in a western, typically at midday. Um, you've got the midday moon. You could there, when talking about that oxymoron, talk about the idea of it representing and being quite powerful or weak um, and it's interesting that um, he's described as the midday moon like the midday moon and using that simile to compare him to the midday moon because actually uh, the moon and lunar cycles are um, again stereotypically linked to the idea of women and femininity um, so it's almost like the roles are reversed here at this point. He's the one that's helpless and vulnerable um, and has failed um, in what he, he's wanted to do. Um, back below um, on its hook, the chainsaw seethed. So 
we've got again that um, zoomorphic uh, portrayal of the chainsaw with its seething um, and that idea of it, the reference to um, anger and aggression um, and that desire to, to want to, to cause destruction. I left it a year to work back through its man-made dreams. Now, when he talks about the man-made dreams, it's interesting here, he's attributing the dreams to the chainsaw, but actually the fact that they're man-made is, it, again, that projection of him onto the, the chainsaw of his own desires. Because we've got this pronoun, you know, re linking back to his own, refers back to his own feelings and accepts that defeat. I left it. Um, the seamless urge to persist was as far as it got, so he did nothing more than have that urge um, to want to destroy it again, but he hasn't actually acted on it. Um, and, I'll, I'll, and there as well I've got another note which I uh, forgot to make reference to when we're talking about um, the midday moon. Um, you could make a link back to the idea of the corn of Egypt, because we've got a reference to an Egyptian god, the creator of life, um, and the moon um, is suggesting renewal and rebirth. Um, so I've got a couple of notes there as well that I'll add. So critics suggest it's about between the sexes, the chainsaw equal, equaling masculinity, um, and the grass equal, equaling equaling femininity. Um, can it also be read as man trying to control nature? So what we'll do, we will um, have a little look through at some of the um, themes in a moment as well. I'll just have a quick um, discussion about some of the um, images that come through. Uh, and then, as I said, we'll move on to the themes. Themes, then. Um, having a look at some of the images. Okay, there are some very powerful images. And uh, as you can see from uh, my colour coding, uh, there's lots of aggressive, very powerful man-made um, imagery created there. I'm talking about the uh, day glow orange power line, the um, gun, the trigger, uh, powder from a keg. Um, grinding its teeth, knocked back, caught a pint of engine oil. Um, as I said, all very um, aggressive and very sort of stereotypically male attributes there as well. Um, and then you've got the contrast with some of the um, descriptions of the pampas grass, um, and very short descriptions of the pampas grass as well, which is really interesting. Um, but this is where we get the ideas then of it, the chainsaw representing masculinity and the pampas grass representing um, femininity. Again, all based on this idea of stereotypes. What I do want to mention as well is the idea of the um, the uh, structure of the poem. Now, we've got eight stanzas, but they're all of a reg irregular length. There's no specific rhyme pattern, so it's actually uh, a blank verse. Um, there's quite colloquial language is used as well, used throughout it. Very straightforward, very sort of easy to understand poem in terms of on the surface of it. It is just somebody trying to rip up this pampas grass, um, trying to get rid of it. Um, so we've got that very sort of simplistic, straightforward description. And um, like I said, that very irregular then um, length of the, the stanzas and the um, non-specific rhyming pattern as well. So it's very sort of um, easygoing, straightforward poem in terms of understanding the surface um, message. Uh, but we can look into it and look at some of the deeper themes that can be pulled out from the poem. So I'm going to change the slide now so you can see some of the points I've made there about some of the themes that um, are often picked out from this poem. Now, I have already mentioned that idea of man versus nature. And again, as I go through these, it might be really useful for you to maybe pause and go back through the poem and maybe colour code um, where you can see examples of these uh, themes and actually whether maybe you disagree with some of these themes coming up uh, or being main themes in the poem. So man versus nature, very typical theme in, in literature where man tries to battle against powerful forces of nature. Um, masculinity and femininity, again um, I talked about those quite a lot throughout um, explaining the breakdown of the poem. So masculinity, masculinity and femininity, again, a very common theme in literature, where stereotypical ideas of masculinity and femininity are presented, usually in conflict with one another as binary opposites. So this, again, where we can get that um, term that we looked at at the start, the idea of uh, binary opposition 
here in the way that um, masculinity is projected as being something quite aggressive, um, quite violent, um, whereas then femininity is seen as absurd and um, it's almost superficial in the way that it um, focuses on appearance and being a very little substance where it's easily cut away. Um, violence, also a common theme in literature. It can be emotional, physical, mental, and certainly in this case we do see the physical violence of um, our narrator tearing down the pampas grass with a chainsaw. Conflict, so um, this theme usually places two objects, characters, etc. in direct opposition with each other due to opposing views or beliefs. Well, that, that's pretty clear. We see the conflict between the chainsaw and we see the conflict between um, the pampas grass then as well. Um, and it's, it's really looking at the symbolism then. So what are they representing? What do you think um, is the sort of deeper meaning behind this very uh, clear surface meaning of what's going on in this poem? Failure, uh, we see that towards the end um, when there's this very big build up as well. And you could could talk about this in terms of um, this theme. There's this very big grandeur, the gesture of bringing out the chainsaw, of preparing it, describing it in such an aggressive way, talking about it having this trigger, um, and yet it fails. So uh, this failure then that comes at the end, theme is often difficult, a difficult emotion to process, um, and is therefore often explored in, in literature. I mean, failure is definitely something that we all find very hard to deal with. Um, and so it's interesting to see it then from this perspective and how there's still those sort of lingering uh, feelings of resentment then at the end with a chainsaw um, and that um, desire to uh, want to go back and have another go at it. Um, and again, that's something that's relatable because I think we've all experienced that idea of failure and, and um, you know, it is such a difficult emotion to process. It is something that we... we we don't like feeling it. We want to kind of go back and and redeem ourselves. And that's certainly the feeling that we get, the sense that we get at the end of this poem. So um, as I did last time, I've included there where I've um, used some other sources just to get some other ideas. And I would definitely recommend having a little look to see what other people have said about the poem. Um, I, I think, you know, so important with poetry, um, as I said, to get your own perspective on it first and think about your own feelings towards the poem and what are some of the messages that you take away from it personally and then having a little look and thinking, well, what have other people said? Do I agree? Do I disagree? Why? Look for your evidence in the poem of where you would agree with, with uh, those other um, maybe critics um, other people that have commented on, on the poem. There's plenty of resources online to have a little look and add to the notes then for that particular poem. So I hope this helped, um, but I will see you on Monday, um, next Monday, for our next catch-up session. And obviously if there are any problems with uh, these pre-recorded lessons, please just let me know, um, and I will sort of structure them differently. I will adapt. So, um, yeah, let me know if there are any issues. Drop me a little message on Google Classrooms, or feel free to email me. It doesn't even have to be about the work if there, is, if there are other things that are... Um, causing an issue with with the online learning then please please don't hesitate to contact me okay i will see you next time